So um, expanding the economic toolkit, I, I think this was a, a, a title suggested for me, so I, but it, it's one that I, I think I can quite naturally go with. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's start from the economic toolkit that we have. How do we define this toolkit that we have? Well, much of the economics that informs gov government policy is based on the assumption of equilibrium, whether we realize it or not. That's the dominant paradigm of, of economics that we have today and that we have had for many decades. And equilibrium, what does it actually mean? It's defined as a situation in which uh, nobody has any immediate reason to change their actions so that the status quo can continue, at least temporarily. Now, how often do we encounter that kind of situation in the economy? It's, it's worth asking. And I actually think we don't have nearly enough debate about this because most of economics just assumes that there's equilibrium and doesn't question it. And then you have some other guys who are less in the mainstream, but are thinking outside the equilibrium paradigm. And they sort of assume that, well, equilibrium is so unlikely, it's so ridiculous, it's, it's barely worth even asking the question. But I think often it is a question of time scale. The idea of equilibrium was imported into economics from physics um, about 150 years ago. And of course, in physics, at one point, people thought, well, nearly everything seems to be an equilibrium system. But gradually, we found out even things that we thought were in equilibrium actually weren't, if, if you looked at them long enough. Even three similarly sized rocks in a mutual orbit in space, uh, it turns out that over the long term, their motion is fundamentally unpredictable. It's chaotic. We think of the solar system as being a very predictable system in a stable equilibrium. But actually, after about 100 billion years, we don't know where the planets are going to be. Their positions in that system are, are actually unpredictable. Um, the weather, of course, we if you look at it on a time scale of a few minutes, you might as well assume it's in equilibrium. In a few minutes' time, it will be the same as it is now, most likely. Um, but if you think about it over a day, it's quite likely to change. And we can forecast it fairly reliably up to about five days. And then after that, it becomes increasingly unpredictable. It's, it's a system that is actually out of equilibrium. Those are physical systems, but our economy is a human system. It's not just a complex system with lots of different parts that interact with each other. It's a complex adaptive system where some of those parts uh, can change their mind about what they're going to do next. Some of those are people. And for an analogy uh, to a part of the economy, I, I think you can think about a football game. It's just one example. It's relatively fixed. The technology is fixed. The rules are fixed. Uh, the number of people on the pitch are fixed. And yet, do either of those teams ever encounter a situation where None of them has any reason to change their actions. Well, no, they don't. They're constantly trying out new things, trying to find ways to beat each other. And that process of change absolutely never stops. So a football game never settles down into equilibrium. Then think about the football clubs, well, Man United and Man, Man City. Uh, they actually have a lot more degrees of freedom. It's not just the individual games they're trying to win, but they have business strategies that they can change. And their business strategies are influenced by technology. The game looks very different after we all have TV than it looked before. And it looks different now we all have the internet, the, the business opportunities. What does it take to be successful as a club? So those football teams, those, those businesses, they never encounter a situation where they have no reason to change their actions. So actually, the more you think about it, the more you think that in most economic situations, we're in a context of disequilibrium, that is constant change, including uncertainty. So that demands a different economic toolkit. And um, for myself, the, the reason I got into thinking about this was because I work on climate change and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that if we're gonna meet the goals that we've all say that we've got for avoiding very dangerous climate change, then what we need is rapid and far-reaching system transitions 
unprecedented in terms of scale in the global economy. And a, a system transition is about as far away from equilibrium as you could possibly get. It, system transition is a situation in which many actors have many reasons to change their actions so that the status quo is replaced with something completely different. So this may be about as far away as you can get, but I think it's, it's a useful test case. If we look at this problem of climate change and understand how is policy making different when you understand you're in a context of disequilibrium, then we can apply those same lessons to many other areas of policy making. So I'm going to talk about this briefly in four ways. Um, the implications of disequilibrium in the economy, first for the role of policy, what's policy for, then for principles of policy making, which often derive from theory and they jump straight from theory to policy, uh, then models and then decision making frameworks. So briefly on the, on the role of policy, well, what do we think the economy is? If we assume equilibrium, we really think that the economy is a machine. We think it's static. It might have moving parts, but the relationships between those parts uh, don't change. We think it's fundamentally predictable. If we know it's starting conditions, we can predict exactly what it's going to do next, or in fact, at any point in time. And the machine functions or fails. Uh, hopefully it functions perfectly, but now and then it might fail. And then the role of policy is fixing it when it fails. So that's very simple. And that's actually the rationale for policy that dominates in certainly in the UK and, and in many other countries. It dominates when you assume equilibrium. If you assume, or if, if you do not assume equilibrium, you accept the reality that any complex adaptive system has many dynamic states of which economic equilibrium is only one and perhaps a very unlikely one to be encountered. Then you recognize that it's not static, it's evolving, it's constantly changing. It's fundamentally uncertain. There are a lot of things you can't predict and you can't even put probabilities on those things. And it has effectively unlimited future possibilities. You don't know how it might change in future. And in that context, there's no meaning to functioning or failing. It, an ecosystem doesn't function and neither does it fail. It just evolves differently. And so the market failure rationale doesn't really work. Yet the market shaping rationale makes more sense that the role of the policy is to guide the evolution of the system in a desired direction. So that's all I want to say about the role of policy. Um, I'll say more about the principles of policy making. And, and by principles, I mean something like a rule of thumb. You know, what do we believe is likely to work? What, what principles do apply to policy that we make? And again, the examples I've given are ones that we encounter a lot in policy on climate change, policy on low carbon transitions, but I, I think they have much wider relevance. So the first one is, oops, that investing in the new is often better than taxing the old. And, this is a contrast with the advice that economists have given for a long time on climate change, that the most efficient thing to do to reduce emissions would be to put a price on carbon. That makes sense if you're looking at the economy as an equilibrium system, you're fixing a market failure by making the polluter pay for their emissions. I think everybody understands that. But what we've seen, as Stefan Halligat said, he's a senior economist at the World Bank, is that actually all of the progress we've made so far on solar, on wind, on electric vehicles and efficient buildings and all the rest, all of that was achieved with policies focused on new investments, not with carbon taxes. And what we've achieved through that, where we have done the right thing, we've achieved quite a lot actually, that this is one example, global deployment of solar photovoltaics uh, in 2020, was around 14 times as much as we thought it would be back in 2005. So more than an order, an order of magnitude, more than we expected. Now, did we choose the second best policy, but just get incredibly lucky? 
or did we actually do the right thing? Um, I would argue that we did the right thing and it was no accident. And the reason is all about the reinforcing feedbacks of new technology development and diffusion. That the more you make something, the better you get at making it, learning by doing. The more you make of it, the cheaper it gets, economies of scale. The more you use a technology, the more other technologies come along that make it more useful, the complementary technologies. And of course, as it gets better, demand for it increases, investment responds to demand, investment drives further innovation, and innovation helps it continue to get better. So you have all of these reinforcing feedbacks that give you increasing returns to scale. And when you invest in a new technology or a new system, you directly strengthen those feedbacks. So you get more back than you put in. Uh, it's like interest on your bank account. Whereas if you just tax the old technology, you tax the incumbent system, you don't get any of those increasing returns to scale. You don't get any extra payback for your effort. In fact, you might even get less because you're pushing against a very robust, resilient, powerful incumbent system. It's quite likely it just pushes back at you, a balancing feedback. Or at best, you get that incumbent system to operate slightly more efficiently, which you may or may not want. So that's much less efficient a way of bringing about change in a desired direction. And of course, that's even more obvious when you look at past examples of technology transitions. Um, the transition from horses to cars came about through people investing in cars, in motors, in factories, in building motorways and writing the highway code. All of that investment in creating the new technologies and the new system didn't come about because we put a tax on horse manure. And that's a good reminder that there are many different purposes for a transition. We're often transitions where we don't know what the purpose is at the beginning, but we just have a sense that there's an opportunity to move from one thing to something else that's better. So thinking of it in terms of pricing the externality is really not a very helpful mental framework for thinking about how you can bring new things into being. A second principle has to do with regulation. Um, another policy tool that often we're, we're told is inefficient. And I think a, a useful principle to think about is that regulation can accelerate innovation. It can reallocate finance um, and force faster innovation. This is an example of a piece of work uh, done by Stephen Chu and his other colleagues named here. Stephen Chu was energy secretary to Barack Obama. Before that, he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And he did this study because in his job as energy secretary, he wanted to have tough energy efficiency standards for appliances like fridges and washing machines and air conditioners. And he knew that would be a difficult political battle, but he thought his own department would be on his side. But the impact assessments from his own economists in his own department kept saying this would add costs, it would add to the price of these appliances. And of course, that followed from the equilibrium logic that if you think the economy is self-optimizing, it's, it's in a perfect state, it's allocated in its investment as well as it possibly could do, then you intervene with a regulation, you distort it, you make it less efficient. By definition, you must be adding costs somewhere. But Stephen Chu thought that didn't make sense. And he went off and looked at the data and he found the opposite, that at the points where uh, new tough product standards have been set, they actually accelerated the decrease in price of these appliances over time. And again, I don't think that's an accident. I think as soon as you think about the economy in evolutionary terms, it makes sense. The rate of evolution is inversely proportional to the fitness of the population for its environment. And if what happens when you set a new standard, a regulation that says your product must meet this criteria that it didn't meet before, then what that means is you suddenly make the current population, the current products, less fit for their environment. So you force the businesses to not just exploit their current position, but shift their resources from exploitation to exploration. In other words, less advertising, 
more R&D and you force them to innovate faster so that their products can be successful in the new evolutionary landscape that your regulation has created. I like to think that's, as a government, actually a very, a very effective way to accelerate innovation. You can pump loads of money into public R&D, and sometimes that's exactly the right thing to do. But at other times, you can just use some regulations, set some tough standards, and force the private sector to stick a load of its own money into R&D and to innovate very quickly. Of course, that only makes sense if you have some idea of what direction you want the innovation to be in. Another way I, I just try and visualize this is you can think of the flow of finance uh, through a sector of the economy as being like this river that flows from you, the consumer, through the producer, off towards the ultimate shareholders or whoever the owners of the businesses are. And in some situations, that can be like a big, broad, slowly flowing river uh, that doesn't really do very much work along the way. But regulation can be like this, this lever that you pull that changes the, the direction of the flow. And instead of letting it all flow lazily onwards, you can redirect at least some of it down a narrow channel where it flows much faster and it has to do some work. That's why we have water wheels in narrow channels. We didn't stick them in the middle of the big, broad river. Thirdly, briefly to talk about tax. Um, in climate change, we're told that to price carbon uh, most efficiently, most, most cost effectively, or even optimally, what it should do is the level of the carbon price should reflect the damage to society of climate change. And many people have spent lots of time coming up with estimates of that. And on the left, here's a, a piece of text from the US White House Council of Economic Advisors from back in 2013, saying that they'd done a rigorous evaluation of costs and benefits and updated their estimate of the social cost of carbon from $36 a ton to $37 a ton. Unfortunately for them, at, at exactly the same time, there were scientists drafting the latest IPCC report saying that actually, unless you invented a parameter representing your willingness to pay to avoid human extinction, estimates of the social cost of carbon could be unboundedly high. In other words, they're somewhere between naught and infinity. And it really just care, depends how much you care about the future of the human race, which is kind of up to you to decide. Uh, there's no correct answer to that problem. So if you're a policymaker, being told that the range is somewhere between naught and infinity is not very helpful. Um, and in fact, it's not very helpful either, being told that it's $37 per metric ton because all that's done is use guesswork and arbitrary judgment to cover up uncertainty and subjective value judgments. So that's not helpful at all. It may, $37 a ton may or may not be useful. A, a better principle is to recognize that in the evolutionary system that is the economy, there's no such thing as absolute value. There's only relative value relative to your own purposes and relative to uh, the context and the value of, of different things related to each other. And for climate change purposes, most likely what we really care about is the cost of the clean technologies compared to the cost of the fossil fuels in any given sector. And if they're, they're relatively close to each other, then the best thing to do if you want to put a price on carbon is probably to make it just enough that the clean technology becomes cheaper than the fossil fuels. And you may be able to activate a tipping point where you shift the dynamics of the system from a state where they're dominated by the balancing feedbacks of the incumbency, that the harder you push it to change, the more it pushes back against you, and they become dominated by the dynamics of new technology development and diffusion where the transition gains its own momentum and it becomes much harder for anybody to hold it back. Two examples of where tipping points like that have been activated by policy, both correspond to the fastest transitions in the world in their respective sectors. Uh, in the UK, we had renewables growing very quickly thanks to targeted investment. And it just so happened that a fixed carbon tax made coal more expensive than gas. And that kicked coal out of the power sector extremely quickly 
And it meant that over the period of a decade or so, the UK had the world's fastest power sector decarbonisation and emissions were reduced at a pace roughly eight times faster than the global average. Norway is really, or, or for a long time has been, the only country that used a combination of tax and subsidy to make electric vehicles cheaper at the point of purchase than petrol cars. And at the time when I put this graph together, uh, Norway's electric vehicle share of car sales was 20 times higher than the global average. So when you do cross these tipping points, you get disproportionately large effects. And there's nothing surprising about that if, from the point of view of how complex systems operate. Um, this, this one, I've, I've stated this in a bit of this principle in a bit of a theoretical way. Allocative efficiency is not the same as dynamic efficiency, but I think this is really, really important. Allocative efficiency, if, if you think of the economy as being in equilibrium, fundamentally static, then economics can be defined as the allocation of scarce resources. That's the only thing that you're bothered, bothered about. How do we share things out in this fixed economy? And if you follow that through again, in terms of climate change and the carbon pricing argument, then the top recommendation is you should have the same cost of carbon, same carbon price across the whole economy. Reason for that is it allocates the burden of reducing emissions fairly and equally across all, all different forms of economic activity. But if you think about the economy as a disequilibrium system, as an evolving ecosystem, then allocation is not the only game in town. There's also a game of change, of creation. Um, and how effectively do you do that? If you know what kind of change you want, how effectively do you bring it about? That's a challenge of dynamic efficiency. And it's absolutely not the same. Um, if you want to bring about fast transitions in each of these emitting sectors, then certainly you don't want the same price of carbon across the whole economy. What might be just enough to cross a tipping point in cars will definitely not be anywhere near enough to do the same in steel. And it may be far more than you need in the building sector or in the power sector. So you actually need different targeted policies in each sector. Um, and a, a final, I think it's a perhaps penultimate principle for policy, um, there's no such thing as technology neutrality. We like to think there is, um, but if you think about an ecosystem and imagine can you intervene in it in a way that is neutral with respect to all of its inhabitants, you quickly realize that's impossible. Anything you do will advantage some of them and disadvantage others. And it's the same in the economy that anything you do will advantage some technologies more than others. Now, that doesn't mean you always know which one you want to choose. And sometimes it will make sense to set up a, a deliberate competition of some kind to see which emerges ahead. But it does mean that you can't avoid choosing to some extent. And the principle therefore becomes that you should choose deliberately rather than accidentally. And we'll come back to an example of this. Those choices we make now affect what options we're going to have later on. Um, so sometimes we, we tend to think that there might be an optimal pathway through time. But of course, there can't be because the future economy hasn't been created yet. We don't even know what the range of possibilities is in future. All we know is that the choices we take now will affect our options later. So even things that may seem like quite a small choice about which technology we use in a given sector to bring about emissions reduction may turn out to have quite fundamental consequences for the shape of the future economy. You can just think back to over 100 years ago when people were testing out cars and they had electric cars, petrol cars and steam driven cars. And the choice to eventually go for petrol cars, of course, had huge implications for the growth of the oil industry and the shape of the economy that we have now. So those were principles of policymaking. Um, I'm going to speak a little more briefly about models. Now, economists often get, uh, academic economists spend a lot of time talking about models. And I find myself often having to remind people that many policy decisions are made without models. 
that's why those principles are so important. But sometimes we do use models. So what kinds should we use? And what's the implication of understanding uh, disequilibrium in the economy for our choice of models? Well, this, this is a quote on the left from Jean-Claude Trichet, president of the European Central Bank at the time of the global financial crisis in 2008 and nine. And he said, as a policymaker during the crisis, I found the available models of limited help. In fact, I would go further in the face of the crisis. We felt abandoned by conventional tools. Now, why would you feel abandoned? Well, the way I think about it is, imagine you had a weather forecasting model that assumed every day was a calm, sunny day with no wind. That would be the only kind of day that it could predict. It wouldn't be very useful for predicting a thunderstorm. And in the same way, if you have a macroeconomic model that assumes equilibrium, by definition, it can't predict a financial crisis. It's excluded the possibility of that happening by its own design. So it's just not a very useful model. Uh, in contrast, on the right, it's an example of a systems dynamics model that was not intended to predict a global financial crisis, but actually did. They just ran it, and that's what it showed happening. So the guy who built that model went around saying, maybe we've got a problem here. It looks like there might be a crisis coming. I think the situation is very similar. Um, I could almost paraphrase Jean-Claude Trichet and say that as a policymaker during the climate crisis, I find the available models of limited help. In fact, I would go further in the face of this climate crisis. Most of us do feel abandoned by conventional tools for exactly the same reason. They're assuming equilibrium when, in this case, we don't just want to predict structural change in the global economy. We want to make it happen. We're not trying to avoid it like a financial crisis. We're trying to make it happen. But it's, it's change of a similar magnitude. And so here's some examples. Well, the wrong models can lead you to the wrong technology choices. These equilibrium models find it very difficult to incorporate the reinforcing feedbacks of technology development and diffusion, because, of course, those reinforcing feedbacks take you very far away from any equilibrium situation. So what tends to happen is that they build in um, assumptions that are highly unrealistic, that downplay that progress in technologies. And so most, most of the models, not just those used by the International Energy Agency, which people are often critical of, but in fact, many of those that have been incorporated in IPCC reports, they've been wrong by an order of magnitude in their projections of clean technology costs. Or if you think about it in terms of the improvement rate, then they've tended to predict this is for solar, an improvement rate of somewhere between 0 and 5% per year, whereas the real value has been 15% per year. So that's encouraged governments to make the wrong decisions about technologies. It's made it look as if solar and wind are likely to be much less cheap than they actually are. Um, second thing is the wrong models can encourage you to make the wrong policy choices, or they might just not help. Um, these are some findings using uh, a model called the Future Technology Transformations Model, built by a guy who uh, happily has, has recently moved to the World Bank. And this is not one of these technology optimization models, it's a simulating model. It doesn't assume equilibrium, it simulates the dynamics of technology change. And here, this is a, an example looking at policies to deploy electric vehicles in India, comparing all these different options, subsidies, taxes, regulations, mandates. And it finds, well, if you want to reduce emissions most cheaply, then, uh, as I've said before, it's, it's not a carbon price. In fact, tax is by far the most expensive way to do it. Cheapest way to reduce emissions in this case is a regulation, an efficiency standard for buildings, uh, for vehicles, sorry. However, that might not be what you really care about. In India, maybe you care more about how quickly can you bring down the cost of the electric vehicles. And there, if you compare the different policy options to each other, you find it's a zero emission vehicle mandate that's likely to bring down the costs of electric vehicles most quickly. So from this kind of disequilibrium model, you get a different view of the policy options. 
And finally, even if you've chosen a policy, um, but you're you're thinking about policy design, again, the wrong model or the wrong assumption can lead you to the wrong choices. And when countries consider their options for carbon pricing, for example, some of them go for a tax, some of them go for a cap and trade, an emissions trading system. And the standard economic theory is that those are entirely equivalent. They might vary in their details of their design, but they're fundamentally equivalent because they play the same role, um, equalizing marginal abatement costs across the economy. But when you run them through, it, in this case, an agent-based model, another kind of disequilibrium model, you find they're absolutely not the same. The interactions between companies really matter. And your emissions trading scheme creates a balancing feedback. The more that one company reduces its emissions, the less other companies are incentivized to reduce theirs. Whereas the carbon tax doesn't have that effect. And when you compare them in this model, you find the carbon tax gets much faster emissions reduction, and it also achieves it while having a, a lower price of electricity compared to the emissions trading scheme. So using the right kind of models, uh, using disequilibrium models where you're dealing with a, a situation of structural change and innovation in the economy is likely to help you make better choices about policy design. Finally, uh, decision-making frameworks. Um, how, how do we actually make decisions uh, in, in any kind of structured way? Well, um, in the UK government, we have this thing called the Green Book, which is guidance on decision-making produced by the Treasury. Uh, and everybody has to take it very seriously because, of course, if you don't, the Treasury won't let you have any money. Um, but virtually all of this guidance, not, not all, but, but most of it, is about cost-benefit analysis. But there's this very helpful caveat, which says that cost-benefit analysis is a marginal analysis technique, most appropriate where the broader environment the price of goods and services in the economy can be assumed to be unchanged by the intervention. But these techniques work less well where there are potential non-marginal effects or changes in underlying relationships. So in a low carbon transition, you definitely want the prices of goods and services in the economy to change. In fact, not just that, but you probably want to create whole new kinds of goods and services and whole new markets, so you're definitely dealing with non-marginal effects and changes in underlying relationships. So even, even what you might think of as, as a very sort of uh, conservative-minded institution has recognized that cost-benefit analysis won't work in that context. So what do you do instead? Well, um, to, together with, with some other academics, um, I've, I've suggested that what we would do instead is something we've called risk opportunity analysis. And this varies from cost benefit analysis in three ways. So one way is if the problem involves structural change, not just marginal change, then instead of assessing outcomes at fixed points in time, you have to assess the likely effect of policies on processes of change in the economy. That like those feedbacks we talked about before in in the, the feedbacks that are built into new technology development and diffusion, or the feedbacks that policies themselves might create, as in that emissions trading scheme example. Second thing is, how certain are we about what the outcomes will be? If the outcomes we care about are all predictable, uh, quantifiable, then we can assess quantifiable costs and benefits, and that will be enough. But if some of the things that are important to us are uncertain, uh, if they're, some of them are unquantifiable, but we really care about them, then costs and benefits is not enough. We also have to assess risks and opportunities. And thirdly, how many different dimensions of outcome do we care about? If it's only one, if, if we only really care about the outcome in the dimension of money, for example, then we can convert anything into that one dimension and we, we just state our, our cost benefit analysis in terms of money, that's absolutely fine. But if, if we actually care about outcomes in several different dimensions, 
then it's better to consider those outcomes in each dimension separately without converting them. The reason for that is when you convert across dimensions, you choose your methodology of conversion arbitrarily. So as in that example of the social cost of carbon, you're taking climate damages, which are in many different dimensions. In fact, loss of human life, loss of infrastructure, loss of land, and you're converting all of those things into the metric of dollars. Each of those things have, has a methodology and you may apply that methodology consistently, but it's an arbitrarily chosen methodology because other methodologies could equally be argued for and justified. So when you use an arbitrary conversion, you actually degrade the quality of the information. If I'm a decision maker, I don't really want my information degraded. I'd, I'd rather have it in its pure form. And to give an example, um, and uh, this is a, a real life example that in the UK is in the course of our power sector decarbonization, uh, there was a point where government decisions were clearly going to affect uh, the outcome in, in a competition between biomass and offshore wind. And at that point in time, uh, biomass was a cheaper power generating technology. And so if you said, well, the task is least cost marginal abatement, least cost emissions reduction, then you would say, well, the biomass is a cheaper way of doing it. it it's a better bet. And one of the economists who did argue for that um, said that offshore wind was the most expensive form of marginal emissions reductions known to man. But I think the mistake he made was assuming that marginal emissions reductions were the goal. And of course, they weren't. There's, there's no point just reducing one ton. That doesn't help anybody. The goal is structural change in the economy, uh, replacing the fossil fuel infrastructure with clean technology infrastructure. And that means it's not an equilibrium context. And, and that line of reasoning just isn't helpful. So let's bring a risk opportunity analysis approach to this. You say, well, first, it's not about the marginal change. It's not dollars per ton of emissions reduction. We do care about the costs, but the costs are uncertain. So what do we know about the processes of change? Well, when the UK was going big into offshore wind, there hadn't been enough of it globally for us to really know what the cost trajectory would be in future. There was no way of predicting that well. However, we could see onshore wind benefiting hugely from the reinforcing feedbacks. Uh, we could see that its cost was coming down uh, according to rights law, a, a constant fraction cost reduction in response to cumulative deployment. So we could see those very rapid cost reductions and because so much of that technology would be shared with offshore wind, you could make a, a reasonable judgment that some cost reduction in offshore wind was quite likely. We also cared about jobs. We want this, this transition to clean technologies, not only to impose costs, but hopefully also to create some jobs and maybe even some exports. And again, that was an uncertain factor. And we could have just left it out and said that's irrelevant, we can't quantify it, so we'll just ignore it from the analysis. But instead, we thought, well, no, that is worth taking into account. And um, it's, it's, we don't know how many jobs it will create, but if we're comparing these two things, then it's just possible that burning wood isn't going to be the major job creating technology of the 21st century. People have been doing that for quite a while before. So the government took what was originally supposed to be a technology neutral policy, but which we'd long realized it couldn't be, um, and lent in favor of offshore wind. And the results of that turned out to be 70% cost reduction over the course of a decade, offshore wind now generating electricity far cheaper than gas. And when it does so, it, it actually operates at a negative subsidy. It's giving money back to the government at the same time as generating clean electricity. And it's created jobs in parts of the country that were relatively poor, high value jobs, and uh, some exports as well. Would have been more e exports if we'd figured this out much earlier on um, instead of letting Denmark take the lead. But never mind, at least we got some. So 
I think that's that's the point I want to end on. Um, as Donna, you mentioned my book. That's where I've put together collated ideas from the last 10 years or so of working on this stuff. And I also created a website where there are various reports that go into these things in more detail, uh, where anybody can just download those and help themselves. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Simon. So um, definitely uh, given everybody something to think about, uh, turning a lot of what we've known on, on its head in, in many ways. Um, but so we've got, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A, um, but we might just, we'll, we'll go to Flavia and then we'll come back to the, to the questions um, after Flavia's had a chance to chat. Uh, and so just a reminder to the people online, if you have got some questions, please put them into the Q&A so we can ask them um, after Flavia has spoken. So um, hand over to you, Flavia, thank you. Thank you, Donna. Kia ora koutou katoa. I'll share my screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I think I've brought some reflections that are, are pretty much complement, like they complement what Simon has just said. Uh, perhaps they give, they give emphasis to a different aspect of decision making, which is public engagement and participation. Um, so, uh, we are all we are living in an era of uh, weak issues and poly crisis. Weak issues are unique, intractable, hard to define, and multi-causal problems that are ultimately unsolvable because attempts to solve them will necessarily result in unexpected consequences and new formulations of the problem. So this is all about the complexity that Simon was talking about. Uh, polycrisis is a term recently popularized by the World Economic Forum in a 2023 report uh, to describe a cluster of related global risks with compounding effects such that the overall impact exceeds the sum of each part. So it's basically a cascade of converging challenges. So challenges that lead to other challenges and so on. Uh, for example, the war in Ukraine uh, contributed to the cost of living crisis that we are all experiencing, which is contributing to social unrest and distrust in government. Climate change is contributing to the loss of biodiversity, which contributes as well to uh, extreme weather events, human health problems, and involuntary migration. So the threads of interlinked crisis may go on and on. Um, so more than ever, governments need to deliver and to be perceived as delivering transformative change uh, that will tackle these, these crises, these issues. Um, we are not talking about change, changes of mindsets only, but the entire decision-making structure, including its tools and processes, uh, need to be aligned with and allow for forward thinking and long-term goals, uh, such as tackling climate change and persistent poverty. The selection and use of analytical and decision-making tools is of crucial importance uh, for this task. Questions are therefore being raised about what policy tools and approaches are most suitable uh, to deliver the transformative change we so urgently need. In particular, uh, how do we better capture the dynamism and the complexity of the systems we operate in to better make choices for current and future generations? So I will start my brief answer to these questions uh, by referring to Danielle Allen. Uh, so Danielle Allen is a professor in political philosophy and public policy at Harvard University. Uh, and she says that uh, the tools of scientific thinking are powerful and of great value. The point is not to abandon them, but to integrate the knowledge they provide into a broader, richer conversation about what we human beings are doing and should be doing and why. So uh, I'm not saying that the expert-based analytical tools that we are used to are not uh, good. I'm just uh, trying to say that they should be combined and used with other tools, in particular, uh, 
public participation and engagement tools. Uh, so this is exactly the point I'm trying to convey. We can make improvements to traditionally used to tools, such as cost-benefit analysis, and I know there, ha there have been several commendable attempts to do so, including the CVAX, the cost benefit, the social cost benefit analysis in New Zealand, which incorporates uh, distributional analysis and qualitative indicators of well-being to traditional uh, CVA. Uh, we can also adopt new analytical tools, which uh, Simon has just mentioned, such as risk opportunity analysis, which require an explicit consideration of different interests in decision making. Uh, and this is uh, very good and uh, very important. But ultimately, it all comes down to how we perceive, use, and combine these expert-based tools with social participation and engagement during uh, decision making. Uh, a, compl a complementary path in the use of predictive tools uh, is what uh, Sheila Jasanoff, another Harvard professor, has called uh, technologies of humility. So she opposes technologies of humility, which are technologies of social participation and engagement with the predictive approaches that are expert-based, which she calls technology technologies of hubris. Um, and uh, well, as defined by, by, by Sheila, by Jasanov, uh, technologies of humility refer to uh, discipline methods to accommodate the partiality of scientific knowledge and to act under ir irredeemable uncertainty. So are ways just to, uh, just to uh, uh, accept that we live in a very uncertain world and that we cannot know everything and therefore we should talk to each other and see how people perceive things and so on. So examples would include frame analysis or the adoption of systematic methods to revise the initial framing of problems and issues uh, by including pu public input. Uh, analysis of vulnerability that are informed by the vulnerable actors themselves, so they become active agents in the policymaking process, and institutional venues of collective reflection and learning designed to prevent monocausal explanations of social problems and risks. So it's all about expanding the definitions and uh, the ways in which we perceive and uh, address uh, problems. In this way, uh, sustained social interaction with affected parties should inform predictive models by exposing the dividends and the distrib distributive costs of innovation and policy change. Ultimately, uh, she advocates for the design of tools through which society could collectively reflect on their experiences and learn together. Uh, most importantly, through which the affected and most vulnerable parts can act as active agents agents in policymaking. Uh, this might sound very abstract. Uh, I'm aware of that. So I brought an example uh, of such an approach. So there has been a lot of uh, talk recently about anticipatory regulation as a regulatory tool or as a different way of approaching uh, the way in which government regulates um, activities in society. Uh, so this is a set of tools and behaviors that have been increasingly perceived as effective in regulating especially emerging technologies or things that we don't know uh, much about yet, such as uh, artificial intelligence, such as uh, new medicines, new um, um, all sorts of emerging technologies. A few of its main characteristics or principles include being largely and explicitly experimental, making use of open data, and prioritizing interactions between regulators, innovators, and in some cases, active engagement with the public. So you see engagement com is coming back here. Once again, the idea of a humble government uh, a government who does not know everything and makes it very explicit that it does not know everything and that there is a lot of uncertainty seems to be present here. 
This focus on active engagement as a complementary tool in uh, decision making is not, however, exempt from risks. So we should talk about the pros and cons. In addition to exacerbating controversy, it risks further excluding vulnerable groups uh, which do not have the necessary financial and technical resources to fully engage. So it should be done carefully and it requires skills as well. So similarly to CBA or to any other expert-based predictive tool, it can feed pernicious rituals of verification and legitimation or tick boxing uh, procedures. Once again, it all comes down to the proper use and implementation of tools, which might be even more important than the tool we choose. I would also suggest that we think about the barriers to the uptake of any of these tools. Uh, the lack of appropriate use, the lack of capability to use, the lack of desire to use would be amongst the main examples of potential uh, and actual barriers. But we also have to think about social values and about the crucial importance of aligning expert-based ways of knowing to other ways of knowing as a fun fundamental task of governments. So we live in a bicultural society in New Zealand, and there are different ways of knowing that are not uh, scientific and Western based that we should uh, consider. So uh, acting as synthesizers, um, and this is a UNEP uh, <clears throat> model uh, that I uh, uh, around the uh, interface between science and policy, and they they say that uh, governments should act as uh, synthesizers, translators, and brokers of different ways of knowing, and that requires as much or even more training and policy capability uh, as what is required to effectively use CBA or any other uh, tool of, uh, of government, of decision making. So how do we create capacity in our civil servants here, in our civil service in boundary spanning and engagement skills? How do we properly implement uh, technologies of humility tools to let the most vulnerable affected parties really have a say in government decision making? How can expert based tools be used alongside genuine social engagement to integrate as opposed to to dominate uh, decision making processes? Uh, well, I'll leave you with some of these questions. These are some of the questions I, I will, would like to leave you with. Uh, although I don't, I might not have the answers to, to them, uh, and I don't, I'd I like to think that asking the right questions can be uh, the first step towards promoting policy capability and policy toolkits that are adequately equipped to tackle the unavoidable and constant uncertainties of the poly crisis we currently, currently live in. So I don't have the answers, I just have questions and uh, reflections. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Flavia. Um, yeah, as always, these types of things throw up more questions than answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were hoping you had all the answers for us, Flavia, but never mind. <laughs>